have some time to introduce themselves. Um, and then we will um, have each presenter present an object that they feel, an object from their collection that they feel best embodies this theme of infamous people or events. So they will have approximately five minutes to talk about their event and object. Um, you will have the opportunity to pose questions to them uh, regarding their, their presentation. After all of the panelists have presented, you'll have a poll, a live poll, that you will vote for which object you feel best embodies the theme. And then whoever wins the poll gets to host the next event. So we at the Anthracite Heritage Museum uh, won the previous um, showcase poll. And so that is why we are hosting this evening. Um, so what I will do is I'll have, um, again, if you have uh, regarding questions, if you have questions for the panelists, you can type them in the chat or you should see a Q and A icon at the bottom of your Zoom window and you can type them in there as well. Um, I will monitor the, both of those windows and then we'll pose your questions or, or I mean, the, the, the uh, presenters can also look at them, but I'll keep an eye on those so that uh, we don't miss anybody's questions. So again, just a welcome. Thank you for being here this evening. And we'll have our presenters just do a brief introduction of yourself and your site. And then we're going to switch things up and go in reverse alphabetical order for tonight. Um, so we'll start, we'll, we'll have, we'll go in the same order for introductions. So Josh, would you go ahead and just give us a brief introduction of yourself? Hi, yes, um, I'm Josh Fox. I'm the curator of the Pennsylvania Lumber Museum, uh, which is located in North Central Pennsylvania in Potter County. Okay, thank you, Josh. Um, Jen Gleim, you can go ahead next. I'm Jen Gleim. I am the curator at the Pennsylvania Military Museum in Bullsburg, just outside State College. Thank you, Jen. Uh, to our other Jen, <laughs> Jen Royer. Hello, I'm Jennifer Royer. I'm the curator at Landis Valley Village and Farm Museum in Lancaster County. Thanks, Jen. Uh, and Sarah? Hi, everyone. I'm Sarah Goodman. I'm the museum educator at Drakewell Museum and Park in Venango County, just south of uh, Erie, Pennsylvania in Titusville. Okay, thank you, Sarah. And John. Okay. I'm John Fielding. I'm the curator at the Anthracite Heritage Museum, uh, which is located in McDade Park in Scranton, Pennsylvania. Okay, thank you, panelists. So we will jump right in then uh, with Josh Fox from the Lumber Museum. Uh, Josh, you should be able to share your screen. Um, and then, like I said, it, while Josh, you can ask questions at any point in time. I'm, I'm not gonna interrupt Josh to, to ask the questions, but then uh, he can answer any questions that you might have about his presentation. So Josh, take it All away. Right. Thank you, let me get my screen up here. All right, so I'm gonna talk about the dam that could not break um, since this is the disaster uh, episode, spoiler alert, it broke. Um, the Bayless Dam break, which occurred on September 30th, 1911 in Austin, Pennsylvania. Let's see, I'm going to be talking about the disaster as well as uh, images from our photo collection here at the Lumber Museum. As uh, you can see on uh, here, the image is of the, the dam, it's obviously after the break, but um, some early 20th century Photoshop going on where they photographer made it look like uh, the water was rushing through. A little bit about Austin. Austin, Pennsylvania is located in Potter County. Uh, it's about half an hour uh, southwest of the museum. It's named after Edward Austin, uh, who was an early settler. He moved into the area in the 1850s, incorporated in 1888. And the town uh, was a center for the lumber industry. Uh, big industry in part of county at the time. So it had not only a Goodyear Lumber Company sawmill, an Emporium Lumber Company hardwood mill, as well as a kindling wood factory and some other supporting services as well. 
the population of the town grew to pretty much a peak of 2,941 people according to the 1910 census. The image of showing Austin before the um, disaster, a little bit talking about the industry over in the corner is the Imperial, the Emporium Lumber Company hardwood mill and the kindling factory here. So the Bayless pulp and paper mill. In 1900, Austin town leaders enticed George Bayless to open up a new paper mill in the town. Uh, he was enticed with uh, tax incentives. Uh, so uh, it's not a new thing. I guess they've been offering businesses tax incentives to relocate for quite some time now. Uh, the town leaders of Austin saw this as a, a job creation uh, program. They were worried about the, the lumber industry, which was seeing a little bit of a decline. Uh, the, by this time, the virgin forests were getting to be pretty clear cut. And the benefit of a pulp and paper mill is that it could use second growth for um, trees. So newer, younger trees for pulp wood in the production of paper. Uh, paper. So it was something that can come in once the big trees have been cut down and use the second growth trees image still showing the Baylor's paper mill. Another image of Austin, uh, get a little sense. This is kindling factory in the foreground here, going and looking back down up the valley and the Baylor's company would be located kind of here at the crux. So the Baylor's dam, the paper company needed a reliable supply of water. In 1909, a concrete gravity dam 50 feet by 500 feet long was designed by T. Hatton on Freeman Run, just north of the town and mill. Now, despite the Johnstown flood of 1888, there were little to no regulations uh, regarding dams at this time, and none of that applied to the Bayless Dam because Freeman Run was not a navigable body of water. Really, the only kind of regulations would be on large uh, rivers with boat traffic, such as the Schuylkill, Delaware, Allegheny. Freeman Run was none of those, so the state wasn't even necessarily aware that this was being constructed. Now, true of a uh, you know true form for uh, some Gilded Age industrials, uh, George Bailey ignored and changed many features of the dam in order to save money. Uh, these included digging down only four feet instead of nine feet for the foundation, a thickness of, of 20 feet instead of 30 feet for the dam, and a wood cap on the overflow pipe instead of a valve that could uh, be turned and opened. And these would prove critical pretty quickly. So cracks in the concrete were noted pretty much as soon as the dam was finished. Uh, on January 22nd, soon after the dam was filled, uh, about a month and a half after the dam was filled, water was noted to seep through the bottom, hence you know, only digging down four feet instead of nine feet, and uh, it caused a bulge in the dam. It can be noted here, the foundation shifted 18 inches in the middle. And then to complicate things, water started rushing over and the wood cap on the overflow pipe could not be opened, so the dam had to be dynamited to drain the water. So you can see in this image here, they had to dynamite twice, first the hole in the dam and then another charge to blow off the wood cap on the overflow pipe. So the drain was, dam was drained. Several engineers, including the designers, suggested needed repairs and solutions, most of which were ignored because they would have cost money. So then on approximately 2 p.m. September 30 of 1911, the dam broke. Uh, after heavy rain, the dam catastrophically failed, releasing about 250 million gallons of water. And the town of Austin and the community of Costello, which was further downstream, were heavily damaged. 78 people were killed in this event. Uh, this image from our collection shows the remains of the Bayless paper mill, and you can see the dam in the background, and that's the distance that the, it travels from the dam to the paper mill, and another image uh, showing the destroyed dam. News quickly spread 
Um, and some of the news was not quite accurate. Here in the New York Times, they reported initially a thousand were dead, and this photograph is not even of the Austin Dam. Uh, it's from another incident. Philadelphia Inquirer reported 850 dead. Uh, these were immediately afterwards and were highly exaggerated. But within four days, enough photographers had converged down to the scene to document it that the Quincy Herald in Indiana had images of the uh, disaster on October 4th. And it became worldwide news. This image here, this dam burst, is from the Perth Daily News in Australia. So the news of this disaster spread around the world. So some of the images from our collection, I've said many photographers descended on down, they took all sorts of images and they even turned them into postcards for sale. So we have a number of these images in our collection. So here's some of the photographers at the dam, another image of the destroyed mill. And this is part of a panoramic showing some of the Goodyear Lumber Company mill as well as a Barnhart log loader still on the rim. A couple of panoramic photographs as well, showing the destruction of the town. Two different views of that. And just more images that show that Austin was pretty much completely destroyed, especially the wooden houses. Some of the, the brick buildings on Main Street at least were able to still stand, but of course heavily damaged. Clock shows that it was a popular image showing approximately the water hit at about 2.30 is when it hit the town. Uh, wrecked automobiles and even images showing uh, some of the more grimmer aspects such as retrieval of victims and the morgue, the temporary morgue that was uh, situated for the town. Now, a lot of this comes from our collection from Emporium Lumber Company. Uh, the hardwood mill owned by Imperial Lumber actually um, survived really heavy damage. This debris that you see around, it looks bad, but it's mostly just because their lumber piles were pushed away. So they lost lumber, but the mill was relatively intact. Uh, image showing the log pond here at the mill. And we do have some of their log books um, registering transactions. And of course, in a very business-like way, the only recordings show that they had to write off some loads of lumber because of the Austin flood. Some images of Costello PA, as I mentioned, it was downstream just a little bit. Here you can see Austin Borough and how Costello is just further bit down on Freeman's Run. Image showing that the uh, destroyed schoolhouse, as well as a railroad bridge that was destroyed in the flood. So, the aftermath the dam finally did spur some legislation, and Pennsylvania enacted the Water Obstructions Act of 1913, really the first dam regulation in the country. George Bayless did not take any responsibility for the break or receive any consequences. He paid for only 30 of the 78 victims' funerals. The state passed funding to compensate the bondholders for their losses, but did nothing to compensate the victims themselves. Uh, images here, you can still go visit the dam today, Austin uh, Memorial Park. Uh, the ruins of the dam still stand and is a park. And then below, the Bayless Paper Company uh, rebuilt after the flood, but it was destroyed by fire in the 1940s, and this is the remains of that rebuilt uh, paper mill company uh, that you can again see today. And so, end with a little quote um, by State Senator Frank Baldwin, who was lived in Austin and was one of the men who brought George Bayless uh, and his mail to town. And it says, I defended property rights. I believe that government should not interfere in the affairs a private business. I objected to having state inspections of the dam. I did not want anything done that might cause Bayless to move his company. Move to a state more friendly to free enterprise with fewer government bureaucrats and less red tape. Now I feel the sorrow, the tragedy of losing my parents and my sister Grace, 
who tried so hard in vain to save them. Experience has taught me one cannot defend property rights at the expense of human rights. This image is what was remained of the Baldwin home in Austin after the flood. And then just a little bit, and it was not only uh, photographers that were there, but film crews as well. Uh, this was in the age of the motion pictures. So you, oh, no, it went away. But you can see a little bit of the some film footage of the area. We just finished showing uh, this actual footage as part of it's not part of the museum collection, uh, but it is part of the Library of Congress's collection. Uh, the whole thing goes about 11 minutes. What's left of this film? I'm obviously not going to take up all that time. Okay, thank you, Josh. Right, um, thank you. Very, at, at least somebody learned something from it, right? That that uh, <laughs> Mr. Baldwin at least learned something from from the tragedy. Um, so if you have questions at any point, if you think of something you'd like to ask Josh later on, please don't hesitate to type it in um, or any of the panelists, of course, as we're, as we're going through here. So moving along, then we will go over to Jen Gleim from the Military Museum. Go ahead, Jen. Get my screen up here. Can everybody see that? No. There you go. You're good now. All right. Cool. Oh, I lost it. There we go. So I'm going to talk about Pancho Villa, chasing down Pancho Villa in Mexico in 1916. Beginning in about 1908, uh, revolution began to rock Mexico when uh, the Mexican dictator Porfirio Diaz expressed ambivalence about running for re-election in 1910. This sort of opened the door for a lot of figures who'd been unhappy with his control of Mexico to uh, start clamoring to bring someone else to power. So uh, a bunch of different groups started uh, engaging in armed clashes with, with the government of Mexico. And uh, by about 1909 or 1910, Francisco Madero emerged as the leader of the anti-reelectionistas and soon after Pancho Villa joined his cause. Pancho Villa was born Doroteo Arango in 1878. He became a fugitive as a young adult when he killed a man who'd been harassing his sister. Um, after that, he lived for years as a bandit and in 1909 started assisting Madero in his uprising against President Diaz. Um, in true revolutionary fashion, uh, it wasn't long before Pancho Villa had a dispute with Madero broke off on his own and formed the Division del Norte or Division of the North and uh, soon after became governor of Chihuahua. Um, Pancho Villa clashed with other rebel factions and in 1916 was part of two separate incidents that killed more than 30 Americans um, on and near the border, border with Mexico. Um, that was the point at which the US kind of said we've had enough and sent Brigadier General Pershing to invade Mexico following his last attack in March of 1916. Pancho Villa was really good at what he was doing and uh, was able to elude General Pershing, drawing more and more federal soldiers away from the US border um, as they tried to hunt him down. As a result, President Wilson mobilized the National Guards of Texas, Arizona, and New Mexico. However, all three of those states had a very small National Guards, and they were only able to raise about 5,000 soldiers, very few of whom were cavalry uh, soldiers on horseback who 
were really what was needed on the border. And you can see here a little bit in the picture, the destruction of uh, Columbus, New Mexico, which had been raided by the uh, by June of 1916, Wilson, President Wilson realized that he needed to do more and activated the National Guard in every state but Nevada, who did not have a National Guard. Pennsylvania, of course, began to send troops. And uh, around the same time, a prominent Center Countyan uh, named Theodore Bull had just returned from Europe and was very alarmed at the escalating tension there. As a result, he believed that the US would soon be at war and recognizing the need for mounted soldiers, he began to assemble a horse mounted machine gun troop in early 1916. And the picture you see here, Bull is the man in the back with the mustache and the two men with him are uh, fellow soldiers, George Thompson, the older man holding the newspaper and the young man on the left is uh, Wilbur Leitzel. This picture comes from Leitzel's family. So in May of 1916, 33 men joined him on his estate, which is now the home of the Pennsylvania Military Museum, and they began training. Um, after several months of training, Bull's privately raised troop is accepted by the National Guard and they become the machine gun troop of the 1st Pennsylvania Cavalry. And soon after, they ship out to Mexico and arrive in October of 1916. They remained on the border until January of 1917. They spent much of their time there um, training and uh, staying on patrol of the border. All the National Guard troops that Wilson mobilized remained on the border. None of them actually chased Pancho Villa, but they stayed behind to uh, protect the U.S. border from the continued threat of attack from various bands of Mexican guerrillas. The picture that you see here is of American soldiers taken by a member of the Bull Troop on the Mexican border. You can see there's a pretty significant number of them on horseback there. These are some other photos taken by Bull Troop members. Um, on the left side, you can see uh, this is Camp Stewart near El Paso, Texas. They are having their gear all lined out from inspection. The other two photos show Bull Troop members practicing with Lewis machine guns, which were at the time a very new invention. Um, and it sort of foreshadows the kind of, uh, the kind of warfare that is to come. The Bull Troop was pretty proficient with their machine guns and uh, were very proud of their service. Um, there's some other photos uh, of, uh, again, Leitzel and Thompson. Uh, I'm not quite sure what they're doing there in the desert, but um, looks like they're looking through some plants. There's another photograph here of a man who's supposed to be on guard duty sleeping in front of his tent. And again, another man hiding behind a rock. Uh, US forces never caught Pancho Villa. But around 1920, he was given a pardon by the Mexican government. He lived for three more years on a private villa surrounded by armed guards until one day he left to attend a christening of one of his men's children and was assassinated. Bull's machine gun troop was redesignated Company A of the 107th Machine Gun Battalion and left for World War I with the 28th Infantry Division in May of 1918. Um, Bull's legacy continues to this day. Like I said, uh, his estate is now home to the Pennsylvania Military Museum. When his soldiers returned home, they created an officer's club and soon constructed monuments to uh, their troops' continued military service. So we kind of have him to thank for our existence today. Okay, great. Thank you, Jen. Um, we will move on then to Landis Valley. Jennifer, you can go ahead. All right. When I was looking at the Landis Valley Village and Farm Museum collection, infamous was a really tricky topic for me to select an artifact for. 
I ended up going with pieces that portray both the characteristics of it being infamous and famous in different parts of the country at the same time. These pieces also portray the characteristics of being infamous at a later time period. Henry DuPont was the president of the DuPont Company after his father's death in 1834 and until his own death in 1889. Henry's father started the DuPont Company under the name E.I. DuPont de Nemours and Company. It began as a gunpowder manufacturer in 1801 because at that time, American-made gunpowder was seen as inferior quality. During the Civil War, Henry DuPont was an adamant unionist and supporter of the US government. He hated the Confederacy and anyone who sought to break up the country. Henry DuPont maintained a strict policy that no black powder would be sold or shipped to states in rebellion or to any customers whom he suspected were Confederate sympathizers. He held fast to this policy and made sure all of the company's sales agents followed his directions. Since the DuPont company supplied as much as 40% of the powder used by the Union forces during the Civil War, which was approximately 4 million barrels of powder in all, Henry DuPont was revered by the North and the US government. He was known and well liked. However, since the DuPont company supplied as much as 40% of the powder used by the Union forces during the Civil War, Henry DuPont was condemned by the South and the Confederate government. He was well known and hated. Confederates would take black powder from the US Army and Navy installations in the South. Most of this powder had been made by the DuPont company. Confederate supporters also made a point to confiscate powder from DuPont's Southern sales agents once they learned of the company's strict secessionist policies. It was calculated that in 1863, the DuPont company lost $110,000 worth of black powder to the Confederates. After the Civil War and the Spanish-American War in 1898, in which the DuPont company supplied gunpowder to the US government once again, DuPont had assets of over $60 million and controlled all the US government orders. At that point, DuPont bought out 100 of its American competitors and closed most of them down. As a result, in 1907, US antitrust laws created two competitors from DuPont and ordered the company to divest from some of its explosives production. DuPont then diversified into newspaper publishing, chemicals, paints, varnishes, cellophane, and rayon. However, during World War I, the government once again called on DuPont to produce explosives. As a result of the war, DuPont made unheard of net profits of $250 million. It was also believed that DuPont led munitions companies in sabotaging a League of Nations disarmament conference in Geneva in favor of a treaty that was more satisfactory to them. As a result, the DuPonts fought against, fought against widespread public condemnation that labeled them as merchants of death. It was believed that the company yearned for war in order to fatten its earnings and gain great wealth. The Indus Valley Village and Farm Museum has a significant number of gunpowder canisters from DuPont and other companies. Most of the gunpowder was used by George Landis, who is seen here. He was one of the founders of Landis Valley and also a rifle, animal, and cigar lover. And by the way, the DuPont company merged with Dow Chemical in 2017, bringing along its mixed history of being infamous and famous for many years. Okay, great. Thank you, Jennifer. We will then move on to uh, Sarah from Drake Well. Okay, hello everyone. Um, one second, let me do this. There we go. Okay. Hello everyone, tonight I am presenting an artifact that belonged to one of the most infamous people of the 19th century. 
you all know what the owner of this artifact did and what he did to become so infamous. And tonight I am going to tell you why we have this infamous man's um, belonging in our collection. And the infamous fellow that I am talking about is of course, John Wilkes Booth. We have in our collection here at Drakewell Museum and Park, John Wilkes Booth Kane. And you can actually see it in this photograph here. Um, John Wilkes Booth, uh, used this cane as a riding whip while he was in the Pennsylvania oil region in 1864. Before leaving Venango County in late 1864, he gave the cane and a cart to visit of himself to Alfred W. Smiley, who Booth shared a room with when he first came to the oil region. Alfred's son donated the cane to Drakewell Museum and Park in 1942. The cane is um, dark brown wood rod that narrows at the tip and the tip has a copper tube uh, sleeve on it. Uh, the, cake's, the cane's handle is a metal piece that is in the shape of a horse's bent leg and hoof. The cane measures in length 32, about 32 inches and the width of the handle is about three inches long. And this cane is on display in the museum's permanent um, exhibit in what we call the community case. Um, in 1863, while uh, visiting family and working in Boston, Booth became friends with a gentleman by the name of Joseph, Joseph Simmons, a banker. And Booth entrusted his uh, acting money that he had accumulated over the over the years to Simmons to invest and Simmons invested that money and Booth actually was able to purchase um, land for his parents and also land for his siblings so that they could um, have homes and things. Um, Booth then uh, shortly after that um, and finding Simmons to entrust with the money he traveled to Cleveland in late 1863, um, where he met the manager of the Cleveland Academy of Music and a gentleman by the name of Amirs while he was performing there. Um, the three gentlemen uh, read about the fortunes being made in the Pennsylvania oil fields, and they decided that they wanted to try their hand and invest some of their money into the Pennsylvania oil region. And they created a company known as the Dramatic Oil Company. And in late January of 1864, um, they traveled to Franklin, PA, where they purchased an oil lease on the Fuller Farm. Booth, um, once he settled in Franklin, then brought uh, Joseph Simmons in on the deal and moved him down to Franklin as well. Um, and today, so here is a map of where the farm was. And today that land is right about over here across from Franklin. Um, the lease for the land was a three acre strip of land um, in this area. The Venango County Recorder's Office says that the land was purchased in part for a sum of $4,000 and it was uh, Mears, his, his wife, um, Simmons, the uh, manager of the theater in Cleveland, Booth and Simmons, all were part of the landowners or the leasers of that land. In early spring of 1864, the men hired Henry Sires to drill the well to a depth of um, 1900 feet and it struck and it produced about 25 barrels of oil a day. And the interesting thing is the well was named Wilhelmina and that was named after uh, Mir's wife who passed away. Um, by the summer of 1864, the Wells production started to slow down and um, Booth realized that he needed to invest some more of his money um, into another well to help strengthen his funds. And he um, invested in a, a very small, amount of money into the shares of a well along Pithole Creek on Heiner Farm. 
And it was shortly after Ruth did that, that his business partners decided that the Wilhelmina well could produce more if they shot the well with black powder. Unfortunately, this had the opposite effect on the well and um, it destroyed the well's production. And that's when Booth decided he was done with the Wilhelmina well and he pulled his shares out of the, um, out of the well. Um, it was also at that time that Booth decided basically that his adventures in the oil region were coming to an end and he decided to pull out of the well along Pithole Creek. Um, and it said, and, and it, it said different amounts of how much money he actually lost in the oil region. Um, but from the different sources I saw, like 6,000 seemed to be about the consistent rate of how much money he lost. One of the interesting things is, um, this is a photograph of where Booth stayed um, and he rented a room at the corner of 13th and Buffalo Streets in Franklin, Pennsylvania. And it was um, Mrs. Weber's home that he rented. And um, today, if you uh, go to 13th and Buffalo Street, you will find that the Elks have purchased the land um, and they tore down the home in the 1950s. And so where the Elk is standing is basically where the house was standing um, during Booth's time. Um, interesting thing is that if you can get your hands on a copy of the book, um, John Wilkes Booth in the Pennsylvania Oil Region by Ernest Miller. Um, it's probably the, the most condensed of what Booth did here in the oil region. But it says a lot of interesting things. Um, Simmons actually stays in touch with Booth once he leaves the oil region. And we all know what happens after Booth led the, left the oil region, right? He, of course, he's the assassin of, assassination of Abraham Lincoln. Um, but there are letters that um, actually the Library of Congress has, um, and also in the National Archives, of Simmons telling Booth, well, you know, here's some, here's a little bit of money from the, your shares of the well, you know, before, before you sold it, some of the profits. Um, but he also tell he says, Booth, if you had, you know, stuck around, you probably could have made some of your money back. Um, and it's interesting. Um, there's also um, interviews done by uh, Alfred Smiley's grandson and things um, that pe people at, they interview about Booth and what they know about Booth in the oil region. And people say that um, he was very friendly. He was very generous. He was very outgoing, um, that he was also very outgoing with his uh, political views as well. Um, and it's also interesting to note that um, that the book does exist, um, if you can find it. <laughs> it's uh, I've searched high and low to find it for you folks to be able to read the story of Booth. But it's an amazing thing to think that um, maybe if the Wilhelmina well hadn't um, stopped producing, that maybe Booth wouldn't have assassinated President Lincoln. But here at Drake Well Museum and Park, we have one of the most infamous people of the 19th century's cane. And that is pretty amazing. And how he generously gave it to his uh, landladies or the, the gentleman that he stayed with. Um, and now we have that cane in our collection. And it's a pretty cool piece to have, um, to be part of that infamous history of, of the of the nation. So. Great, thanks, Sarah. Um, there was a question about what type of wood the cane was made of. That's a good question. And I'm sorry to say that I don't know. <laughs> I will have to, I'll have to look at that again and see if I can find out. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, all right, so we will wrap up then. We have one more presenter, which is John Fielding uh, from the Anthracite Museum. So go ahead, John. Thank you. All right. Uh, 
Uh, everybody can see that, right? Uh, so apparently 1911 was a bad year for uh, Pennsylvania in regards to uh, industrial accidents. On April 7th, 1911, uh, one of the deadliest anthracite mining disasters took place in Troop, Pennsylvania, when a fire broke out at the Price Pancoast uh, mine. The disaster resulted in the deaths of 72 miners and one rescue worker. The two collections that I'm going to discuss today focus on the events of the disaster and uh, give us a glimpse of the emotional and financial hardship that the victims' families faced in its aftermath. Um, the first collection that I'm going to highlight is EC 9431, which consists of uh, 23 glass lantern slides published by the Feature Amusement Enterprises Company of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, the slides depict the horrors of the Pancos mine disaster from the viewpoint of a spectator. Um, and this is the first slide in the series. Uh, you know, it's the title slide. It says Scranton Pancos coal mine disaster. The date it occurred. And they're trying to, um, I guess, uh, hype it up, I guess, by saying nearly 100 coal miners. So there's a little bit of uh, elaboration in a lot of these slides as well. I'm not gonna go through all 23 of the slides uh, because I, I do wanna talk more about our second collection. So the slides do get into uh, the mine site before the fire, uh, crowds gathering, large number of crowds from the, the surrounding communities gather uh, at the uh, colliery site, the mining site. Uh, when the breaker whistle blows because of an accident, Usually people go to the mine to see who is, um, hopefully not their, their loved ones, um, but who's affected by it. If their loved ones, uh, friends, family, neighbors, coworkers are okay. Uh, once again, a little bit of uh, uh, over-exaggeration. It wasn't an explosion as listed on the uh, uh, slides. It, it was a fire, but I guess when you're trying to sell, um, slides to the public, uh, an explosion sounds more exciting than a fire. So they, they kind of go into some of the, the more uh, gory details, uh, and I've excluded some of them, but they did include the funerals of the uh, victims. So on April 9th, 10th, and 11th, 1911, uh, were the majority of the funerals for the 73 victims. And Adding to the emotional trauma of the families uh, at that time were the unethical business practices of many of the funeral directors, not all, but many of them. Uh, the funeral directors were accused of paying uh, unrelated crowd members to claim uh, the bodies on behalf of the families and then charging them exorbitant amounts for, the, uh, for their funerals. The company, uh, the Pancos, Price Pancos Coal Company did uh, provide some payment towards the, uh, the funerals for the, the, the victims. The funerals didn't mark the end of the disaster. Uh, the 56 widows and 123 orphans that were left behind sort of had to pick up the pieces and figure out where they were going to go next. Um, that was hard for many of them. Uh, most, of the, uh, most of the victims were recent Eastern European immigrants. Some had only been in the United States for as little as two months when this accident happened. Uh, and at least uh, from, from some of my research, at least 19 widows uh, did not uh, read, write, or speak English fluently. So that compounded uh, their problems. They weren't able to communicate, uh, adding to their anxiety. So you know, we have the trauma from the accident, we have this financial stress uh, and uncertainty, and, and sometimes the uh, inability or, or hard, hardship of communication. So what, what choices did uh, the widows of the time have? And in 1913, in the anthracite region, they, they didn't have many options. Uh, they could work in a textile mill, uh, they could uh, take in borders to supplement the family income, or they could remarry. And you know, so they didn't have many options. And now steps in the community. So, and that brings us to our second artifact, 
which is AC 2001.10.1, which is a uh, leather bound ledger compiled by the Pancoast Relief Fund Committee, which details uh, compensation paid out to the beneficiaries uh, of the Pancoast mine disaster. And I use the term beneficiaries because they paid out mostly widows, but there was also a, uh, a sister of one of the victims who was paid uh, compensation, a mother of one of the victims, a father of one of the victims, and a, uh, a completely orphaned child as well. So if they, they paid out, um, well, first of all, the community got together with the Pancoast Relief Fund Committee and raised over $90,000 for these families. And they paid them, they paid the money to them in, in two different ways. Uh, one was a lump sum payment and one was monthly payments. So the women in the, the photographs that you see around the ledger, they received uh, monthly payments. And those monthly payments, uh, they began in, on November 9th, 1911 and continued in some form until 1924. One of those women who received the monthly payments was uh, Sarah Dawes. Her husband was fire boss Isaac Dawes. Uh, he perished in the event. He, he was not in the, uh, the area where the, the fire started, but he ran in. Part of his job was a, as a rescue worker within the mine. So he ran in to try to save uh, some of the miners or, or at least make them aware that the fire had started and he ended up perishing uh, trying to bring word to the rest of the mining uh, miners in the mine. So Sarah is one of the, the widows. She gets a, she decides to take a monthly payment. So if you notice, she's got a photograph of her uh, in this compensation ledger. There is a, a number of women on the previous page who also have photographs. The reason why they took the photographs is so they knew who was picking up their check every month. So it was a type of um, fraud prevention uh, at that time. Even in 1911, they were thinking about uh, preventing fraud. So to make sure Sarah got her check every month and that it was her, they used her picture. Uh, if you notice, Sarah too, and, and the women on the previous page, if you had a good look at them, they, they're all wearing their funeral gowns. So they went to get their pictures taken and pick up their first checks on November 9th, 1911. And a lot of them showed up in their funeral uh, gowns. So in some ways, seven months later, they, many of the women were still in mourning. And Sarah's got a brooch on of, uh, you know, that has an image of her uh, late husband, Isaac, within it. And Isaac and Sarah were supposed to celebrate their uh, 10th wedding anniversary on April 11th, uh, 1911, just three days or four days after the accident. And instead, she was attending his funeral on that day. Sarah never remarried. However, 19 widows did, and six did within the first year. Um, so if they remarried, uh, the recipients of, of any of this compensation, they, uh, they had to kind of, they were presented a dowry of, of sorts. Um, and usually what happened was the widow was paid $100 and then $25 for each child under the age of 13. And the reason why under the age of 13 was because if they were 13 years old or older, they were, suppo they were supposed to be pretty much working at that point in time. Uh, at least in the, the anthracite region, they could find jobs working in the textile industry or in the mining industry. So uh, women were uh, compensated and they had to sign sort of an affidavit stating that they were gonna get remarried. They would accept this uh, dowry type of money and they would stop receiving their um, uh, monthly lump sum payment. And one of the ladies, Elizabeth Mitchison, she signs it down there at the bottom, uh, this statement, and then uh, next to her, Victoria Grukowski does the same. Uh, if you notice though, Victoria Grukowski uh, has a uh, mark, and I'm gonna try to zoom in on that mark to see if you can see it a little better. 
she uses a mark, probably indicating that she uh, is not, uh, well, she, she probably can't read or write uh, English very well. Uh, 19, actually 18 other uh, widows uh, used their mark when signing documents. So that's, that's how we kind of got the, uh, the 19 number for them not fluently reading and writing uh, or speaking uh, English. So <clears throat> now um, the results of the accident. So there were uh, some changes in the anthracite mining laws that required all interior structures to be built with non-combustible materials. And um, that happened relatively quickly. So the fire started in the Pancoast mine on April 11th and by June 11th or April 7th, 1911. By June 7, 1911, you, uh, you actually get the, the Pennsylvania State Legislature pass a bill uh, requiring uh, all interior structures to be made of non-combustible materials. So that happened relatively fast um, in terms of politics. That was um, a pretty bipartisan at the time. And yet, in 19, but it wasn't until 1915 that Pennsylvania enacted its first workman's compensation law. Now, the workman's compensation law didn't really help any of the uh, victims' families from Pancoast. It was not retroactive. So despite the new uh, laws, many of the, the lives of survivors, they changed uh, relatively uh, little at this point in time and continued to rely on their monthly payments or some of their lump sum payments that they had received earlier from the Pancoast Relief Fund. And that's, that's it for me. <laughs> okay, thank you, John. And thank you again to all of the panelists. Um, so what's going to happen now is, uh, John, when you can, you can, you can start the poll. Okay. So you'll see a poll that will open up for you and you can vote for which of the presenters you feel, uh, which object or which collection you feel uh, best embodied this theme of infamous persons or infamous events. Um, your vote will remain anonymous, so you can vote for whomever you wish. Um, while that's going on, I would ask our panelists, please, to also put in the chat uh, a link to your donation website for your site. Um, the attendees, please remember that all of these sites are nonprofit organizations and would would you know, we'd be happy to have donations from any of you uh, if you feel so led um, to post, uh, to, to donate some, some funds there. Uh, and if you're near any of our sites, certainly come and visit. They all are, all are open now uh, on a limited basis for the weekends, um, but check, check your local, your local uh, PHMC sites for their, their opening hours and come back and visit us. Um, so go ahead and check those those links and vote in the poll. Uh, John, when you see that people have responded to the poll, you can you can go ahead and announce the winner with great fanfare. Okay. So, so far, we have 28 of the 38 people uh, who have okay. voted. So uh, we have people continuing to vote. Okay. Votes are still uh, trickling in, so we'll give uh, we'll give everybody another uh, thirty seconds, uh, maybe a minute to uh, to finalize their votes.
We have 33 of 39 people voted. Um, if you haven't voted, uh, please cast your vote uh, shortly. Um, I'm gonna be closing the poll in about 15 seconds. Okay, if you, uh, if you wanna make your vote, uh, if you've decided final, um, please make your vote now. Uh, if not, uh, I am gonna close the poll. Okay. So um, our winner uh, today was uh, Landis Valley. So congratulations, Jen. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, um, great. And uh, congratulations, Jennifer. And congratulations, Landis Sally. So Landis Sally will be hosting the next, uh, the next showcase. Um, I just want to address uh, one of the attendees asked about running the, the closed captions. Unfortunately, there's not a way to disable that I don't believe on your individual screen. Um, I know that they're not always accurate, which is unfortunate, but we do it for accessibility issues um, or access for accessibility so that um, if we have attendees uh, who require the closed captioning, it's not perfect, but um, it's, it's at least something there. Um, so unfortunately, no, the answer to your question is unfortunately, I don't believe there is, um, but uh, Sorry if it was distracting. Um, so with that, I will wrap up the program. I'd love to thank you to the panelists for your presentations. They were all very interesting presentations, uh, very interesting objects. Thank you to all who all of our attendees and thank you for your comments um, in the chat and for your questions. Uh, I hope to see you at a, a future uh, showcase. And as I said, please check if you have a, a site near you uh, or if you're going on vacation this summer, uh, visit one of our PHMC sites uh, across the state and uh, we hope to be able to see you there. Okay, thanks everyone. Have a great evening. <laughs>